Hi everybody, I'm going to take some time and talk a little bit about the performance of the Gauss-Seidel linear solver and how we can improve it for larger problems. I'm going to start off showing you a little demonstration using uh, a system of linear equations that has 2,500 equations and 2,500 unknowns. So I ran this, it's uh, from the group project, this is what uh, the result for group 1 would look like using a solver tolerance of 1 times 10 to the minus 6. Um, and making this calculation, it takes 19,020 iterations to go through and complete the calculation, as you can see on this line from the output. The final answer for hydraulic head in the domestic well, and Matt's well, is 151.82 meters. Now these two numbers are going to be important later when we improve our solver and improve the performance because ideally what you want to happen when you improve the performance of the solver is you want to get the same answers, you want the same iteration count, but you want it to happen a lot faster. So the big problem we see here is on this line here, the elapsed time. This is the actual amount of time it takes for the solver to come up with a solution. And it is 2,927.7 seconds. Uh, if we convert that into minutes, so it's a little more tenable number, we get about 48.8 minutes. So that's pretty close to 49 minutes. So if you wanted to run this problem more than once, each time you'd run it using the standard GS solver, it would take you almost 49 minutes each time. So we want to improve the performance so that it can run a lot faster. In order to do that, we need to identify what is slowing things down and then try to eliminate that problem so that we can uh, speed up our code. Okay, so when we have a system of linear equations that are set up like this, um, we can express this in terms of a set of matrices. So we can solve this using our gauss seidel solver. So our matrix form of the same equation would look just like this, with three equations and three unknowns. You're always going to have the same number of equations as you have unknowns. We've talked about this before. Now if we had four equations, four unknowns, it might look a little more like this. So we'd have this set of equations here with four equations, four unknowns, and then if we were to write this out in matrix format, it would look something like this. Now, each equation always has each unknown in it. So with four equations, four unknowns, all four of these equations are going to show uh, x1, x2, x3, and x4. Even if the equation itself doesn't actually include a particular variable. So maybe we have something that looks like this, where the third equation just starts with a32x2, a33x3, a34x4. The equation may look like that, but what we're really seeing here is we're seeing a zero value for one of the coefficients. So we'd have something like z uh, 0x1 plus all this. So when you put it into matrix format, it's going to look like this. This gets replaced with a zero in that case. Now this is going to be true if we have three equations, three unknowns, four equations, four unknowns, or 2,500 equations and 2,500 unknowns. That's what we're looking at for our class project. So in our class project, we are looking at a grid of data. This is a representation of our data grid. Of course I'm not going to draw 2,500 equations, 2,500 unknowns on the board, or a grid with, or a 50 by 50 grid. I'll draw a 5 by 5 grid instead. Let's say we are, at the moment, interested in this particular grid square here, number 13. So the number in each of these grid squares represents the row in the A matrix that contains the coefficients for the equation for that unknown, for that particular unknown. So if we're looking at grid square 13, we're going to be most interested in flows across the boundary between 13 and 8, between 12 and 13, between 13 and 14, and between 13 and 18. So we're going to want an equation that's set up to calculate all of those four flows. Now, because we're setting this up as a linear system of equations, each equation is going to have to represent each unknown. So each of our equations is going to actually have some representation for, you know, for example, for equation number 13, it's going to have h1, h2, h3, h4, and h5 in it, in addition to the ones that we're interested in. 
So if we write out our equations using the uh, physics that we've discussed previously, our equation is going to look something like this. So we're going to have, um, I'll just kind of quickly or slowly scroll through it, and you can see all the pieces of this equation here. So there are lots of them. But if we break it down a little bit, what we've got here is we have a coefficient, another coefficient, another coefficient. This one's you know a little more long-winded. Another coefficient, another coefficient. And then we've got a series of unknowns. So we've got all of our h values. These are the unknowns here. And these h values, the five that I just circled, correspond to what we're looking at in this grid picture here. So we have h8, h12, h14, h13, and h18 as our unknowns. Then finally, at the end here, we have a constant on the other side of the equation. So this is a standard linear equation here. Uh, and we could write it out in a more shorthanded way that would make it a little easier to see all at one time on the board here. It might look something like this. For the diagonal, I'm just going to call it D13. That's the diagonal in our matrix, it turns out. And that's multiplied by H13. So all we're doing here is uh, replacing these long-winded coefficients with shorter variables here. Okay, so this is a shorthand form of the same equation. Now, note that this equation has just five terms in it. on the right side of the equation. There are five terms. Now remember, we are dealing with, so for this particular picture, we're dealing with 25 equations and 25, un, uh, 25 unknowns. It's a small version of what we're gonna deal with in the project with um, 2,500 equations and 2,500 unknowns. So if we were to actually write out this equation with all of its uh, unknowns associated with it, it would look more like this. So you notice we have 0 times h1, 0 times h2, 0 times h3, all the way up until we get to h8. And there we have an actual numerical coefficient. Then we keep going here, and we have an actual coefficient for h12. Then we have our diagonal at h13. Then we have another, another numerical term for h14. Then a couple more zeros here followed by a term for h18, and then everything else is zeros until we get to the equal sign. Then we have our constant on the other side of the equation. So this is the complete form of the equation for what's going on in our grid at grid square number 13. But there's a lot of zeros in here. So there are 25 terms here. Only five of them are non-zero terms. The rest of them are zeros, so 20 of them are zeros. If we were to write this out in matrix format, it would look something like this. So our diagonal is here. And if we take one particular row here, so let's say this is our equation along here. We'd have our diagonal here. We would have a value here at our diagonal minus 1. So remember, with the, uh, with the indexing for the diagonal, the uh, row index and the column index are the same for the diagonal. So the first number we're going to be interested in here is going to be our diagonal. At the diagonal, j, that's our column index, is equal to i, that's our row index.
The next one we're going to be interested in is right next to the diagonal, before and after at these two locations. So we're going to have j equal to i minus 1 and j equal to i plus 1. Now what we're doing here is we're finding a way that we can predict what our non-zero values are going to be. Since most of the values are zero, we want to predict where we're going to find the non-zero values. So the last two are going to be in this location here and this location here. Now, those are a little more difficult to predict, but if we look at our equation, we can actually make a count starting at our diagonal to figure out where those are going to be. So we started our diagonal here, where j equals i. The ones we already did, we did uh, i plus 1 and i minus 1. So that got us our next door neighbors. But we need to count out how far we need to go to get to the other non-zero terms. And a good place to start, again, for that was going to be the diagonal. So we can count terms here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If we count the other way towards the other term, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So the difference there is going to be i plus 5 and i minus 5. So j equals i plus 5, j equals i minus 5. Now, we want to set this up so it's a little more universal for any code. So it's not always going to be 5 necessarily. It's going to depend on the geometry of your problem. So let's go back to our grid, our map grid here, where in the x direction, we have five grid squares, so nx equals five. And in the y direction, ny is also equal to five for this case. Now, depending on how you set up your for loops to build your index array, that's going to decide which of these two values you're going to use. Because my x loop is the inner for loop when I set everything up, I'm going to go with nx. If you use the y loop as the inner for loop, then you do use ny. But coming back down here to the terms that we're going to be interested in, these are going to be the non-zero terms. Now instead of doing i plus 5 and i minus 5, we'll do i plus nx and i minus nx. And that's going to give us the five terms that we're going to be interested in that are going to be non-zero. Everything else in this A matrix is going to be a zero. So now we want to go back to our GS solver and we want to uh, calculate which um, or figure out which values are going to be zeros and which ones are not. The whole reason we're having performance issues with the GS solver is we're dealing with an A matrix that contains a large number of values and most of those values are zero. So in our A matrix we have 2,500 rows and 2,500 columns for a total of 625,000 values. Most of those values are zero. So let's take a look at our GS solver and let's identify where this is going to be a problem. So if we take, let's go directly to our while loop and take a look at that part of the code. This is where we really want to deal with all of these things here anyway. So um, looking at the while loop, with the demonstration that I started off with, uh, recall that we ran through 19,020 iterations here. So this while loop here runs through uh, 19,020 times in order to come up with a solution. Now we get inside the while loop, we have this for loop here that starts at one and goes through the total number of equations that we have. So in our case for the project, we have 2,500 equations. So if we're going through this for loop 2,500 times, we're doing that every single time we go through the while loop. So that means we're running through 2,500 equations 19,020 times. So that gives us a total of 47,550,000 times. So we're going through a lot of work here. Now, when we get inside of this, this for loop here, we see this next for loop here, the J loop, which goes from one to the total number of unknowns. Now, this if statement in here eliminates one of them. 
but the total number of unknowns is 2,500. We're skipping one, so we're going through 2,499 of our unknowns. We're doing that on every equation. So we're going through 2,499 unknowns on each of 2,500 equations. We're doing that 19,020 times for each iteration. So if we multiply our number again here by uh, 2,499, that means we are going through 118,827,450,000 times through this for loop, doing this operation here. That is almost 120 billion floating point operations that we're trying to complete. This is why it takes 49 minutes to run, because we're doing all those operations. Now, if we look at this particular equation here and what it's doing here, we are taking an existing x value and we're modifying it by subtracting off aij times xj. aij is accessing the values in the A matrix, most of which are zero. So anytime aij is zero, aij times xj is also zero. So we're taking our x sub i value, whatever that is, and subtracting off zero. So we're doing nothing, really. And then we're replacing x sub i. So we're basically just looking at x sub i, doing a calculation that comes out to zero, and saving that same value we had before. We're accomplishing nothing, but we are using processor cycles to do that. So the way that we can improve the performance of our code is to find a way to take this for loop here and have it only look at the numbers that are non-zero. So we want to take this for loop and only do this for the non-zero numbers. So instead of doing it 2,499 times, there are at most five non-zero values on each line. So we can eliminate a lot of these operations here by only looking at the non-zero values. So instead of doing 118,827,450,000 floating point operations each time or you know, when we run this code, we could instead uh, pare that down to be only 237,750,000. So that still sounds like a lot, but it's nowhere near 120 billion. So we are several orders of magnitude fewer operations that we need to do here. So we need to go through this code and set it up so that we can do that. So to do that, we're going to start off at the top. So first thing we want to do, we're going to change the name of this solver. So this is no longer going to be our standard GS solver. This is going to be a grid optimized GS solver. So I'm going to call it GS solver grid. And I've already changed the file name to reflect that. The other thing we need to do is we need to look at our list of uh, list of columns that are actually going to be important. So I'm going to scroll back down in the code. We'll come back up to the top here in a minute. We'll go back into our, our while loop here. And before we get into this for loop that goes through each of the unknowns, I'm going to just make a list of which columns I'm actually going to be interested in. I'm going to call it capital JJ, and it's just going to be a list of these values. So we're going to start off at uh, whatever row we're in, i, so i is the row, that means our diagonal is going to be uh, wherever our row index and our column index are the same. So that's going to be i. Others we're interested in, we're interested in i minus nx, we're interested in i minus 1, we're interested in i, we're interested in i plus 1. These are all the, all the locations that we came up with on the whiteboard a minute ago. We're also interested in i plus nx. Those are the only five values we're interested in. So with this for loop here, we don't necessarily want to go through all 2,500 values. We just want to go through these five. Those are the interesting ones. Now, in order to calculate this, we've introduced a new variable here. We've introduced nx. So nx is the number of uh, values in x of our grid. The standard GS solver knows nothing about the shape of your model grid. So if all, it, all it knows about is how many equations and how many unknowns. It needs those to be equal and it's just going to know that number. So if we have 2,500 equations, 2,500 unknowns, 
the GS solver doesn't care if it, those are arranged in a 50 by 50 grid or a 250 by 10 grid. Doesn't matter. This solver doesn't care. All it needs is uh, 2,500 by 2,500 A matrix, and it'll work. But now, if we need to use NX here in order to find our locations, now this solver needs to have a little information about the geometry. So we're going to go back to the top, to the function prototype, and we're going to add one more value in our function prototype. So the original GS solver just took A, B, X, and the tolerance. I'm going to add one more line here. So now we're going to bring NX in as well. So NX is going to be an input to this solver. So when you call the GS solver grid, you have to remember to also include the NX value as it comes in. Okay. But back to our, our while loop here, our main part of the code. So we have a list of the five values we care about. So instead of having our for loop go through all 2,500 of them, it's just going to go through these five. So I'm going to change my for loop here. I'm going to name it lowercase jj. We'll, I'll show you why in a second here, why I'm doing that. And it's going to go from, instead of going from one to the total number of unknowns, it's just going to go from one to five. Because it only needs to look at those five values. Now, the first thing we need to do is figure out which column we're actually looking at right now. I'm going to identify that as J the J I was using before. The reason for that is then I won't have to change much later. So J, we're going to look up in this capital J, capital J matrix, our current lowercase jj value. So if jj equals 1, then j is going to be equal to capital J, capital J, sub jj, 1, which is i minus nx. So j is going to be i minus nx the first time through. When jj is 2, it's going to be i minus 1. When jj is 3, it's going to be i. When jj is 4, it's going to be i plus 1. And when jj is 5, j is going to be i plus nx. OK, so now you've properly identified our j value. Now we look at this if statement. So this if statement is going to be the same. If j and i are equal, then we're on the diagonal, right? j equals j, 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 j. This is 3. It's i, then we're on the diagonal. We still don't want to do this operation on the diagonal. That hasn't changed. The only thing that changes is we also don't want to do it anywhere that is going to be a 0. So now all we got to do, we have to add one more thing here to our if statement to make sure that everything stays in bounds. So we're going to do that like this. We're going to add, it's actually two more things we're going to add here. We're going to make sure that j is greater than 0. We can't have a column 0. We can have a column 1, but we can't have a column 0 or a column negative 1 or anything like that. So we want to make sure that j is still greater than 0. Just in case we happen to be, let's say we're in row 1, i is equal to 1. Well, i minus nx, if nx is anything greater than 0, which it is, then i minus nx is going to be less than 0. So when it plugs in here, then j would be less than 0. That would be problematic. Likewise, i minus 1, if i is 1, i minus 1 is 0. And again, that's going to be problematic. So we want to make sure we don't run into that problem. We also want to make sure we don't go out of bounds on the other side. So this keeps us in bounds on the left, but we want to keep in bounds on the right too. So we need to make sure that j, sorry, that j is less than or equal to the uh, total number of equations or total number of unknowns. In this case, it doesn't matter which, but we need to make sure that we're in the right place. So j less than or equal to unknown. Again, unk is the total number of unknowns from when we ran our size command upstairs in this code. OK, that's it. We just made a few very minor changes here, but that's all we need to do in order to make this code run a lot faster. Now again, I remind you that this gridded optimization, or this optimization for gridded data, is only going to work for systems of equations that are representing a four-way uh, solution 
like we're looking at for our groundwater problem. Um, it requires the zeros to be spaced in exactly the way that it is for this problem. If it's not, if the zeros aren't spaced this way, then this code's not going to work anymore. So this is, this code is using the gauss seidel method, but it's much more specific to this kind of problem in order to speed up the performance of the solver while using a sparse A matrix. When I say a sparse A matrix, that means it's a matrix that's mostly zeros and has a few key non-zero values in it. And that's what our A matrix looks like. So now I want to move on and demonstrate the performance improvement that we're going to get from this. So now that we've modified our solver and optimized it so that it skips all the extra zeros in the sparse A matrix, we can run our uh, code again, this time using the different solver, and we'll see if we can make it run a little bit faster. So it takes a few seconds to run, it should, and then when it's complete, we'll be able to compare. So now that we finished, it's finished. So we can see that on this line with our iteration count, it's still 19,020 iterations, just like it was before when we used the regular solver. And the final answer is still 151.82 meters, which is the same as we got before. But this time, the big difference comes in here with the elapsed time, so the amount of time it took for the solver to run. It took about 10 seconds. So we went from 49 minutes to 10 seconds. So that's a, a large improvement. And that really allows you to be able to run your model over and over again while changing some of the inputs. When it takes 49 minutes to run, then you know it's a big deal to try to run your model more than once. But when it only takes 10 seconds, then you can run it and change things and run it again. So this allows you the opportunity to uh, use your model uh, without such a big uh, time overhead. One other method I have uh, you know, up my sleeve here to make the solver even faster than the grid optimized solver that we just put together for MATLAB. So in order to do this, we need to actually work in Octave. So I'm not going to expect anybody to actually do this, but I want to show you kind of what's possible here. So uh, what you see on your screen here is this, the same run that I just did in MATLAB, but this is run in Octave using the grid optimized solver. So again, we get uh, 19,020 iterations and a final answer of 151.82 meters. So that is uh, what we're looking for. Now this was using the uh, grid optimized solver that sped things up a lot in MATLAB. So in MATLAB it went from 49 minutes down to 10 seconds. What we're seeing here at Octave is it's taking uh, 6,933.36 seconds. So that's a very long time. We can convert that to minutes just to put it in perspective here. Um, that's taking 115 minutes, 115.55 minutes. So this is on the order of almost two hours that it took. And this is running the optimized solver. Running the regular solver in Octave, I've never actually gotten it to finish. Um, I've never had the patience to get it to finish. Um, the reason things are so much slower in Octave has to do with the built-in uh, built optimization and solution engine that comes with Octave versus MATLAB. MATLAB has a license they have to pay, uh, you know, a site license like the one that Cal State LA has costs thousands and thousands of dollars per year to maintain. Um, an individual license when you're not a student is also pretty expensive. We're pushing a thousand dollars with that license. So when you pay that much money you expect to have the better equipment. Now Octave is free so you don't have to pay anything for it. It works just fine, but it's a little slower. Or, for a case like this, a lot slower. But there's a way around that as well. And I actually came up with this uh, before uh, Cal State LA made MATLAB available to students and faculty for free on or off campus. So I had to come up with some kind of solution so I could run the project, uh, project codes myself and get them to work and do so in a more timely manner timely manner without having MATLAB proper myself. So uh, what I did was I wrote the gridded GS solver, but I wrote I rewrote it in C++ and then created an external utility that Octave can access that's written in C++. So when we run it that way, I'll show you 
how that works here using my optimized solver. No, this is the, the grid optimized solver, but instead of writing it in MATLAB, I wrote it in C++ as an external utility. And that speed thing, speeds things up even more. So when I run it now, it'll still take a couple of seconds. But here, again, we're getting 19,020 iterations. That's the same as we got using the gridded solver. It's the same as we got with the regular solver and regular MATLAB. Same answer, 151.82. But in this case, it took less than three seconds. So this is even faster than the grid optimized solver in MATLAB. Um, but again, this utility is only put together to work in Octave. So um, if you're working in MATLAB proper, it's going to take about 10 seconds. If you're working in Octave, you can put together this type of utility and speed things up even more. So again, I'm not expecting anybody to be working in Octave, but um, I just want you to know kind of what's out there and this kind of thing is available. So there are multiple ways you can improve your performance, be it either through a optimized solver or even creating an external utility.